Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Megan, how are you? Welcome. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time. I, I know you're busier than ever now, somehow after school, but I appreciate you hopping on for a little while and chatting a little bit. You're a fan favorite. A lot of people wanted to hear from you. So. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, so recently kind of wrapping up the world of gymnastics and moving on to other things, but what's new and exciting in your life now that you're, you're kind of in the next chapter? Yeah, lots of things. It seems like the world kind of opens up once you're done with a sport. You're like, wow, when I was at practice, I couldn't do all these things. And now I have so much free time in the middle of my day. I don't know what to do with myself. There's not enough Netflix specials. <laughs> exactly. There's there's so many options, but um, just figuring it out day by day. I'm starting a new job soon, spending time with family while I have a little bit more downtime. That's been great. And then traveling, seeing friends, um, all those things, trying to do it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Juggling the 13 plates of all the things you wish you could do, right? <laughs> exactly. Not trying to miss out on any possible moment right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I guess I want to have you on one because we are going through like a roll call, of like people we'd love to hear their experiences from. But also, I just I mean, I appreciate people who are not only working so hard athletically, but are also doing so many other things above the sport to try to give back. And, um, you know, I think I think you're someone who um, I think is doing so well in the sport, obviously, when you were when you were competing, but also just like had a really good ripple effect on like the community as a whole. And so one, it's an applause to you, because I know that's not easy at all. But I'd love to first kind of talk about um, how in the world can you do all the things, right? How can you like maintain athletics and academics, try to do a side project, try to have a personal life? Like it seems like an impossible task in college gymnastics, but I'm curious how you did it. All right. Well, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, it's no easy task to do, quote, all the things, but um, I think it starts with just making sure that you're good as an individual, putting yourself first in certain moments so that you can put those around you first when you need to. Um, like when you're working with the team, making sure that I'm my best self to be able to show up for my team or show up for class and exams and all the things that I'm doing. But um, that was a, a major focus for myself. These past two years, I would say I really learned how to make sure that number one, I'm good and I'm ready to bring my best self into mm -hmm. every moment, and every interaction I'm having with people. Um, but also just knowing that like when you're in college, you have these four, I got five, like this gifted extra year to enjoy so many opportunities and really seize the day on all those different things that you have an opportunity to do. And I, I really tried to make the most of every day and be really intentional about how I spoke to people and what engagements I was working on, whether that's a personal project or something involved through the school, um, to be really intentional with where I used my energy to best, I guess, like make my efforts worthwhile. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting, right? You said that. So like making yourself good first. And I think as you know, we were both in young gymnastics growing up, but like that is such a foreign concept to probably a lot of athletes, which is what do I need to do for myself? Or like, do I need to maybe put a boundary up or like kind of speak up for myself and advocate for myself? Like that concept, particularly, I think in the, the female gymnastics side is like very, very foreign. So like, is that something that you had from a young age? Did you develop that as you got older? Like, what did that look like? I was not born with that. No, <laughs> I think um, naturally uh, as gymnasts, we're super tough and we're the people that can do it all. We can do whatever you need us to do. Really, like we're chameleons, too. If you need us to thrive in this one area, we'll figure it out. We'll get the job done, even if it's something that we're not comfortable with. Mm. So I think that's a strength in a lot of situations, but that can also be very draining on yourself physically, mentally, emotionally. So in college, I got to a point where I think my ability to do that and stretch myself so thin ran out. And I kind of was like, huh, maybe we need to change some things and start working a different way or focusing on certain aspects of life that I wasn't even paying attention to, to make sure, like I said, like that I'm good. Mm. Um, but it's definitely a process, still something I'm figuring out, especially as I transition out of gymnastics, you kind of have to relearn those habits in a completely new way because life is always changing and that's exciting, but it's also difficult. Yeah, for sure. And so I guess in college, when you were going through this is advice to younger people who are either going through this or trying to like, what is for you? Like I'm good getting to, is that like time with family? Is that like out of the gym? Is that in the gym, but still like toning it down? Like, what does that look like for you? <laughs> it honestly depends on the, the time of year during the season, whether you're off season or in season, or you have a lot of school, you got to take it day by day. But I think for me, something that really helped me was making sure that 
I had a plan. I'm a very detail oriented person. I'm like one, two, three, ABC, like that kind of <laughs> person. If it go things go off of plan, like that was very stressful for me. Mm. So it kind of, I kind of had to find that balance of at the beginning of the week, having a plan and setting myself up for success, but also reminding myself that it's fine. It's really not that big of a deal if something goes off, but really giving myself structure that I know that just the way that I'm wired and I'm built, I knew I needed that. So I, I learned myself in that way, but also tried to grow in areas that I was less comfortable in of being like, you know, if, if my ankle is hurting one day and I can't do what my beam coach Jenny wants me to do, that's okay. Mm. Like trying to build that into myself as way that way. So I had a plan, but if things went astray, kind of learning that it was okay. So that really helped me uh, kind of grab a hold of. I'm glad we're starting with this because this is like for sure one of the biggest elephants in the room for like gymnastics in general, which is like, I think on the, not all coaches, I hate generalizing, right? As a coach myself and as someone who works in the medical side too, is like, sometimes I think we have unrealistic expectations for young athletes in particular, which is like, you always have full energy. You're never hurt. You can do all the conditioning, all the assignments. And like, that is an impossible standard, I think, to keep up with in gymnastics. And so that has to be just understood by everybody, gymnasts included. But two is like, you, you need a massive amount of, of self-esteem and confidence to speak up and say like, no, like my ankle hurts or my back hurts. or like, I'm just gassed and I can't do it. Can you speak to maybe like how to have those communication skills? Because in realistic standards, a lot of people are fearful that if they speak up, their coach will kind of give them shade or their teammates mm-hmm. will say like, you're, you're just trying to get out of the assignment or in college, they'll be like, oh, you're like, you're letting the team down or we need you or like, so how, what's that tug of war between like, okay, this is something I can push through or like, no, I need to speak up and say like, no, I'm not really able to keep right. Going. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's something I certainly struggled with leading up until college, even though I'd say I was blessed with a great coach um, for my, like from, I'd say like 13 and on when Mm -hmm. you're in those challenging years of gymnastics, when your body starts to hurt, gymnastics gets harder. I had a great coach and he really enabled me to be able to communicate with him, but I still had that internal feeling as if I came into practice in my back, my knee or my ankle or something was hurting, or if I was even like had a cold and I was sick, I Mm. felt like I was doing something wrong and he was going to be disappointed in me because he's my coach and he wants me to come in and be my best self every day and train and get better. Mm. But as I've grown as a person and as an athlete, I, I realized that I was only hurting myself by creating all of those scenarios in my head when really when you're working with a coach or with a team, everyone wants each other to be able to come into the gym every day and be the, their best selves, but also feel their best. And if that means taking a step back, you kind of have to focus on the the bigger picture and the long-term plan. And that's something that at Florida we talked about a lot is not focusing on like, oh, well, if I, if I don't do this routine this one day, we're not going to win a national championship. Like that's mm. too far out. You got to focus on day by day, focus on the process. Don't focus on the outcome. And then And if it means to do less numbers one day or to not even do anything on a day, but that's going to set you up for success to be able to win the next day in that short term, that's what's so important. So I I think just trying to recondition your brain in a way to know what's a real thought and what's kind of like this crazy thing that you've made up in your head is is something that I had to grow in a lot. And I, I know that's tough, but focusing on making sure that you're good every single day will get you to the long-term goal. Yeah, that's that's such an important concept. And and from hearing other people, I guess, at your level who competed wise and, and calibrating that is, I think another important thing I hear from them is like, it's really important to detach your sense of self-esteem like from your performance. Like, obviously we're all competitive. Yeah. We want to see you win. But if you're like, super happy and super excited when you hit for your team and then you're miserable when something goes wrong like that roller coaster is is crazy right because you're constantly thinking that like oh my god only my my worth or self-esteem comes from like if i can hit for my team if i'm doing well at gymnastics and i think moving from that mindset to like what's in my control and what's the best version of myself is like Mm -hmm. a daunting task but i hear that as a constant theme with like people who are going through high pressure situations like you've been through Yeah, for sure. It's all about how you define success, too. If you're going to define success on something that you can't control, then you're never going to feel as if Mm. you've succeeded and you've done your job. But if you're focusing on the things that you can control, like waking up every morning and focusing on where your brain is, how your body feels, what you're doing to help yourself get better and make progress every day, then you're going to be able to feel successful and kind of catch that momentum in your career as an athlete. 
Mm, yeah. And I think that concept of like, you're, you're good as you enter the gym, as you enter, whatever you're doing is, is really important to set the foundation for these big moments where maybe you do. And I'm really curious about this as I've watched you compete for a couple of years. And it seems like sometimes you have absolute ice in your veins. Like it's unbelievable. Like these moments of pressure that you or other people have, and you're able to just like do the exact same thing. And I'm curious, like, does that come from just loads of preparation? Is there something you're doing on your own? Because obviously a lot of people would like to develop that talent. <laughs> That, that's such a tough question to answer because yeah. there's definitely not ice in my veins. I'm, I'm human and I'm, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm freaking out on the inside a little bit when you have that moment because it's terrifying, but it's exciting and it's something that you know you're ready for because of how you've prepared. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no like one thing that I, I do to make sure that I'm good and I'm ready to get up if someone fell before me, if that was the first person or the third person, or if we're losing or whatever the pressure circumstances are, it's, there's so many different things, but I think it starts in the gym. It starts with how you train. And for me, something that's helped me a lot as an athlete is focusing on where my head's at when I'm training. Mm. So say I like take a turn in the gym, I get down and I think, Oh, like, why was that good? And I, I log that. So then when I get up to go compete, I remind myself of what it felt like to do something good in practice. Um, and I can remember that specifically. So it's really, it's in my head. But then there's so many other things like what you're saying to yourself is huge. Mm. I can even like for, I'd say freshman and sophomore year, the things I was saying to myself were like, oh, I hope I make this routine for my team. Instead of like, no, I'm ready for this. And I know I'm going to make this routine because my team is counting on me and they trust me. Like things like that, your yeah. dialogue in your head is so powerful. And I'd say that's another big one of how, how I'm able to be the same every time. Because it's not so much physical as it is mental when you're already trained, ready, you're in the moment. You've prepared for months. What happens in that moment is really whatever your brain wants to happen, not mm. what your body can control. Your body has like you trained your body for those months. And in that moment, yeah. it's, it's your head. Yeah, it's so wild how sometimes the most like cruel and terrifying things that are said to you are from yourself to yourself. It's nothing externally. <laughs> your friend would never say this to you. It'd be cruel and unusual mm -hmm. if they did out loud. But for somehow or some way, I think when I was younger competing, I, I just like tolerated things that I would never say to somebody else. But like, you really do make ridiculous scenarios yeah. in your head of like, what's going to happen if it doesn't go well? Oh, for sure. It's so funny, too. I was actually working with um, some girls at a gymnastics camp on confidence and self-talk and things like that. And a way that I used to define like negative self-talk and just help them differentiate was like, if you wouldn't say it to your friend, then why are you saying it? to yourself, you know, yeah. that it's a simple question. But then I actually like the next few days, I, I was saying some negative things to myself and thought about it. And I was like, <laughs> I, I'm so hypocritical, because I just told these <laughs> girls, if you wouldn't say it to your friends, why are you saying it to yourself? But mm. it's still hard, even if you're practicing these habits and trying to focus on the things that you're saying to yourself and how you're treating your your body, your brain, it, it's something that you have to work on consistently to check in with yourself and make sure you're good. Yeah, absolutely. Right. All these things are just like key components of like keeping yourself like in a good position where you can handle such a, a crazy schedule. And I think you kind of mentioned a few things, but like, you know, time management and like how you talk to yourself and also like having a, a good support system. Is there anything else that you were particularly fond of using or developed skill wise, like to keep your head above water with such a busy schedule and high pressure and stuff? Because I think a lot of gymnasts, unfortunately, really suffer in silence mentally, for sure, about like the weight of the world is kind of on top of them and they feel as though they can't really get their way out. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I could go on and on for days about the different things that I've tried and what's worked because, again, it is different in every season that you're facing, whether it's a tough time in school or a really high-pressure situation in the gym. Or even if it's downtime, I notice that even now post-sports, I will wake up and not have anything on my agenda. And I'm like, wow, you're so lazy. Like, why aren't you doing anything with yourself? Yeah. Like, it's okay. It's okay to to take a moment and be still no matter what season you're in whether mm. you're super busy or you're not super busy to to check in with yourself maybe just take a few moments for me it's like prayer or breathing those mm. are two things that I, I use a lot to kind of center myself and be able to walk about my day feeling better more clear uh, more grounded um that is one of the craziest things is the is the internal lazy talk, right? Like I for <laughs> sure still struggle with this. Like this morning, right? I had like all these podcasts to do and I'm like laying in bed and I'm like, oh God, I should really sleep and I should get like well prepared for the day. But like, oh, but if I don't, I'm like super lazy and like I'm like, oh God, <laughs> internal struggle. 
Right. Yeah. I know for me, I was like going to go work out this morning and then I did not Then of course I'm beating myself up because I didn't, but my body wanted sleep. So you, you have to listen to your body. I, I think too, for gymnasts, it's, it's really tough because we are trained to constantly be excellent and to be perfect in whatever we're doing, or at least to strive to be perfect. And in life, there's no way to be perfect. There's no right or wrong way to walk about your life. So I think having some grace with yourself in mm -hmm. any situation, no matter if you're an athlete, a, just a student or like what, wherever you are, if you're like a working professional, it's okay to take a step back and be like, I'm good. I, yeah. I'm okay. It's okay that I slept in or didn't do this or did that. Like, it's okay. Yeah. And not to back to negative self-talk and beating yourself up. Like, not like if you do need a day off where you're like super sore or super tired, or honestly, you just need a day to just like watch Netflix and just chill and get your mind right. Like not right. crushing yourself for that is so important. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So I definitely want to pivot into talking about the tiny bow project because this thing is super dope. And I did some, some, some digging here and correct me if I'm wrong, but you said on your Instagram, the numbers were 10 causes, 10 organizations, 10 seasons meets 21 ambassadors, eight brand partners, 2000 ribbons and $5,000 donated, which is pretty dope. Can you share more on these numbers and what they are and what they mean? Of course, honestly, I'm going to have to pull up the Instagram post too to keep myself on track. I know. But... I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know it's hard that I, I should, you know, get a rep as hard too. Yeah. Well, the numbers are, are just the concrete measures that that we can post and share. But really, I think what's been the most impactful throughout the Tiny Bow Project is how it's touched so many lives and yeah. changed, I think, how, how we think about even the NIL space or mm -hmm. how young athletes approach practice and how they speak to their teammates. Like there, there's so many facets of it from the educational portion to the financial portion that you can't even – yeah. You can't even bridge in the middle in an Instagram post or a graphic that yeah. sums up the impact. But that's been the coolest part of it is just seeing how many people's stories are able to shine through the causes that we partnered with. And to feel that impact in myself as well. Like it, it started as something to give back, but then to walk away from it being like, wow, I, I learned so much about all of these causes, but also about gymnasts and stories of people who are struggling with some really tough stuff and were for once in their lives able to feel supported feel valued and feel heard in the gymnastic space is is something that's it's priceless you can't put a number on it and yeah. that, it just warms my heart to this day to be able to see that impact live on in wherever tiny bow project goes next yeah and and correct me if i'm wrong but this started as you wanted to kind of use your platform platform your fifth year as something that's like bigger than yourself and mm -hmm. you found as though this was maybe the the best kind of marriage between a charitable like situation and gymnastics and stuff like that so did it just come out of thin air like have you always had like charity work in mind like where does this and where does Corey come into this situation right well yes to talk about tiny bow project you have to bring up Corey tomlinson he's a goat he's amazing he's my lifeline <laughs> often mm -hmm. but um it's funny to think back because i remember a time when it would be breast cancer awareness month or spirit week for a state championship meet when i was a, a younger gymnast and I would go out to Michael's with my mom and get ribbons for all my teammates to, mm. to wear. And there would be like a theme for each day or a cause that we were working on. We did bullying prevention. We did all kinds of things. And I had kind of forgotten that I did that growing up. And then it started from a conversation with Corey talking about bringing some additional value into my fifth year because it was a gift for me. I, I had had four amazing years at UF and totally did not expect to get to do gymnastics for an additional year. And I, I felt really blessed to have that year. So I wanted to use it in a unique way. And NIL kind of came in at the right time for me to be able to do that. So I had that conversation with Corey about just doing something impactful. And then I got a text from him asking me to send him photos of how I wear my hair, like totally not related at all. Yeah. And then from there, we just talked it through and built it out step by step. It, it's a blur because we talked about it so much, Yeah. <laughs> but there's some, some really cool moments that happen to ultimately build out a project with 10 causes and 10 affiliate organizations. And we spent a lot of time focusing on what specific causes were close to my heart and also included my teammates and what we stood for. I wanted it to, it was never about me. I wanted it to be about the community and about people who it ultimately would be impacting. Mm. So we spent time to make sure that 
I, of course, cared about these things, but they resonated with those around me as well. And then from there, just continued on. And Corey, his role in all of it was making sure that our partnerships with the organizations were sound and that we were a good brand fit, that we weren't necessarily affiliating ourselves with an organization that didn't align with my values. Um, So he was huge in making sure that all of that red tape and all of that worked out really well. And we were able to build out um, a storefront on my website. And he actually was the secret shipping department. So when (laughs) anyone (laughs) ordered a tiny bow ribbon pack, Corey got the notification and he was packed. He had a little (laughs) manufacturing station packaging the ribbons (laughs) and sending them out. So he is truly my partner in all of this. And I, I couldn't have done it without him. That's amazing. Yeah. And I think uh, there's two things that come to mind. One is someone who tries to do a lot of charitable work. There's the idea and the emotion, and the excitement. And then there's like the actual tactical operations mm-hmm. of running a business a little bit and understanding finances and like taxes. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. So it's, yeah. it's a huge shout out to you because I know from the back end what really goes into it. But I'm curious about like we saw on TV, which was like causes and the talks about it, but like on the back end of the, of the tail of I mean, it, like what else was happening that was cool for you behind the scenes? Was it like talking with people and stories or meeting brands and connecting? Like what else happened that maybe we didn't see at face value? For sure. I think a huge thing that happened was a few brands stepped up and immediately were like, we would like to donate money. However, we can help like brands who are financially able could donate more money than I even had in my bank account as a college student. Like that was a really cool thing to see. Yeah. Um, But then also, I think it opened up a door for me to have really great conversations with a lot of my teammates and then Mm. extend those conversations to athletes on other teams um, who we were competing against. Uh, We had so so many good conversations that we also shared a few on social media through Instagram stories of my teammates stepping up and kind of sharing their testimonies about certain causes that they cared about and why they cared about mm. those causes. And that's exactly what Tiny Bow Project stood for is like bringing people into the impact. And if it's Savannah Shane here talking about pride or Alex McGee talking about how her family member was impacted by breast cancer, like whoever it was, those girls were able to share their personal attachment Mm. and share that on social media and reach so many others and impact so many lives. I think that was a really cool part. And then one of the coolest moments for me that like top five moment was walking out for our first meet. Um, The cause was mental health. So we had these obnoxiously bright lime green ribbons <laughs> and it was actually a quad meet so all four teams i secretly like walked into their locker rooms before they got there dropped off ribbons um so when we marched out all four teams were wearing the same oh, ribbon so cool. and it was this obnoxious color so you couldn't look down and not notice that we're all wearing these lime green ribbons i think that was the coolest thing because that really gave tiny bow project some momentum to build off of as we went and then we we followed up with the remaining four home meets where I like made secret fairy drop offs of ribbons <laughs> to the girls. Ribbon fairy drop offs? Yes, yes. <laughs> I tried to before they would arrive in their locker rooms, but I think it was LSU was already in the locker room and I walked in and was like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Your ribbons. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> That's so cool. And so now you kind of have your, you know, I guess your your initial phase or your Genesis launch, is this something that's like a one and done move on to a different charity? Do you want to keep doing this as years come by? Like what's your, what's your vision for maybe this year and beyond? Yeah, it's, it's tough to say concretely. Um, Right now, what we're focusing on are impact partners. Like recently we did something with the special Olympics, Florida team, Mm -hmm. um, which was just being able to capitalize on a moment and empower them to, celebrate with some ribbons um, in their hair that were the same colors for the Special Olympics. Um, And then we're partnering with an upcoming college state of mind camp in Brooklyn, New York, uh, which the focus there is like all things college gymnastics. And we're bringing in this impact component of how you can get involved with charities and giving back like as a college athlete. So kind Mm. of preparing them, but those two fit the mold um, right now. But Mostly where I want the Tiny Bow Project to go is just to inspire other student athletes who are college athletes already or upcoming college athletes to use their platform for good. Um, I don't see the Tiny Bow Project continuing to exist in its form, as in like, I won't be wearing ribbons or competing on 
on beam or whatever in a leotard yeah. anymore. But I, I hope that the project inspires future athletes to do something similar or maybe gives them some tools to like figure it out or they can always talk to me of course but that's how I see it living on is just through other athletes taking on similar NIL projects yeah that's cool right to like kind of catalyze someone to maybe do something they've been brewing on themselves and I think definitely watching that and I guess in general like sometimes we're so in it in gymnastics about like you know the meets and the scores and this and that and mm -hmm. I think like you have to really take a step back and realize like one we're all insanely grateful to have something that's like a voluntary hobby that we can do as an additional thing in addition to our lives. And I think even beyond that layers out, which is like being extremely lucky to have the the time, the support, the finances to be involved in gymnastics at a high level is really like a super big privilege that I think a lot of people maybe sometimes forget. And not that we can't enjoy the sport, but like when you dig down some of these charity things, like, oh my God, there's people that are like just barely trying to get by with certain conditions that have just been dealt a really tough hand in life, which is why I'm such a sucker for charity. Because like, even in the big broad spectrum of like what we do here, it's like, this is such a gift that we can even be involved in in, in any way, shape or form, you know? Yeah, I've, absolutely. I mean, to uh, a moment that kind of hit home for me too, was when we did childhood cancer week, I am here talking about time these ribbons in my hair and there's a lot of kids who are going through chemotherapy and radiation and don't have hair right now. Like just to even think about that, I, I had a really, a real moment or thinking about, I got an email from, um, I, I believe I'm trying to remember her name. I don't remember, but I got an email from a woman and she was just talking about how she doesn't have access to clean water. And here I am, I had just gotten out of practice. So here I am. I'm hydrating. I'm taking a shower. I'm also doing laundry. And I was just thinking about my privilege and how much clean water I'm using in the moment just to do these things that are not even necessarily needs. I, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm like on my computer doing homework, have no idea also with my computer sitting in front of me, like all yeah. these things that really hit home. And I'm like, she doesn't even have drinking water and they have children who are dying from diseases when they just need water. Like those crazy moments uh, are something that Tiny Boat Project brought up for me. And I, I hope it gave others perspective as well. Um, for how yeah. Much we can be. yeah, there's definitely some moments when you realize like how much stuff you're just able to have for granted or things that like, you know, you're, you're asked to. And some people were dealt like, just brutal hands in life, man. Like whether it's like genetic diseases or whether it's just a position in life or certain things in our society that are still very much needing to be worked out. Like it's tough sometimes just to, just to keep your head above water. You know what I mean? I, I, I think a lot about that when I get like in the busyness of my daily life or like, I find myself complaining about like just the stupidest thing, you know, just like, like, oh, I can't believe this went wrong today. I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Like this is such a, like a first world problem complaint, you know? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think that's something that was really impactful for our team too. Um, I would say the Gators gymnastics program is has great perspective on life and we're not complainers or anything like that, but to, to be able to compete for something bigger than yourself is something that always brings us together and reminds us just of how blessed we are and how privileged we are to be able to attend this university and be rewarded with all of the, the gear and the education and travel and everything that we have that equips us to be able to do our job on Friday nights. But to just take a step back and think about that can be really empowering um, and really humbling too. Yeah. And, and kind of on this topic of NIL, which is obviously something very new and we're all navigating the waters. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, what it has done. You know, I, I think it's it's great. And there's also some kinks in the, in the wheels here. One is which to build a brand, to have the ability to, to have some way to present yourself is amazing. And like for you, for example, you can use it for extreme good. But I also worry about the the stress of maybe having some of these things come up, particularly for someone who's maybe young and is just going into college. Like, there's a couple of people I've talked to where, you know, it seems as though managing some sort of a brand deal or having to keep up an image is like very, very stressful. And I worry sometimes that we're, we're really asking a lot of someone who already has so much on their plate. And so I would just love to hear your thoughts on like good, bad in between, like all that. Yeah, I, I feel all of those points. I think this past year was huge. And I, I definitely think that it's great that student athletes are able to make money off their name, image and likeness. Um, totally echo your thoughts on the stress of it, um, especially coming into college. I can't imagine being a freshman trying to balance a new campus, new classes, new teammates, all of those things, all while having people knocking on your door, constantly wanting you to also do work for them. It's again, it's a privilege, but it, it can be very heavy. Um, I think this past year was 
a learning year for athletes, for university campuses, for staffs and for brands as well, just to figure out what even we can do um, and all the opportunities that are in this space. I think that's been, it's been good to see that develop, but as we move forward in NIL, I, I do think there's a need for education or just talk about the yeah, boundaries yeah. of NIL um, because it, it's an optional thing. You're not forced to do it. And that's me speaking from a privileged perspective of someone who was on a scholarship and was not forced to financially support myself. Like I, I didn't have to go get brand deals because I needed to pay my student loans or my rent. Mm. Um, but there are student athletes out there who need to do those things and it's huge for them. But I, I just think there needs to be some kind of framework or education yeah. and maybe another student athlete out there is creating some kind of course or something. I hope they are um, right. to help student athletes and brands navigate the space to make sure that everyone in it is being able to productively work as an NIL student athlete influencer, a yeah. student, a student athlete, and for these brands to be able to work with student athletes in a way that is beneficial to both parties and is not taking advantage of student athletes. Yeah. And that last point is exactly what comes to mind for me, which is unfortunately with a lack of education, something new, if there's no guide rails or systems is sometimes, unfortunately, people do get taken advantage of a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think what I, what I hear from you and what I can maybe offer from a lot of business work is like, you have to really understand the brand and you have to make sure that like the morals and the ethics and what they stand for and what they're doing for aligns with what you also believe in. Right. Because there's no amount of money that's worth quote unquote selling your soul for if you don't align with that brand or they're doing things that are like not really in vibe with what you believe. And so that's, that's always important is researching and really vetting out a brand for what they believe in. But what other lessons learned can you maybe share with people that are either un incoming to college or are now like listening in college and are going to kind of be navigating the waters next year for brand deals? For sure. I think a huge thing in NIL is being authentic. Don't commit to something that doesn't speak to you, if it doesn't align with your values, then it's probably not going to bring great things. The money is not worth it. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think that's a really good guiding point to take a step back. And when you talk about personal brand, for me, that's what I mean is what do you value and what's important to you? Because right. if you can, from the start, before you enter into any deals, take a few weeks or a month and say, make a list. These are the things that I value. This is what's important to me. Mm. Then those are your buckets. That's where you, st you stay in those. And if it doesn't fit, you throw it out. That was a, a huge thing for me um, when it came to looking at contracts and working with brands and even like, does it go trash? Do I respond? Do I work with them? Like it's not, it's not worth your time because your time is so valuable. And then I think another thing is read things carefully. <laughs> <laughs> <Shocking>. <laughs> Be very careful because like, sadly, there are, there are brands and individuals posing as brands who are looking to take advantage of young athletes, young, young individuals who were so busy and you get this offer, you may miss something. So I think it's very important to, to be careful and to make sure you look over everything or if you're not sure, ask your friend or see if they know someone who can help you read through a contract because it is so important that you know what you're signing yourself up for before you are stuck in something for six months, 12 months, whatever that be. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And I think so important to maybe audit your own life of like what products you already use or what brand you already like. And some of them are a little reach, right? Like Lululemon is probably not going to sponsor you if you're a freshman, but there might be like certain categories in your life, whether it's like, you know, clothing or whatever that like you already believe like in that brand and what that would like organically fit with your personality and what you do every day. And yeah. then you can kind of bring it out and be like, okay, what brands are available that I can maybe make contact point with versus just like, you know, hoping for like some random brand to come to <laughs> your deal, you know? For sure. I mean, it's all about value exchange too. If you're sure. looking, if you love a product and it brings a lot of value into your life and you're looking for a brand partnership, there's no shame in reaching out to them. The worst they can do is not respond or say no. no. Yeah. So I think that's something that, that is huge for athletes. If you don't have the biggest platform, that's fine. If you do have a big platform, also fine. It really doesn't matter. It's about how you sell yourself, how you see yourself, how confident you are in your own values and your identity, and then talk about that with the brand and how that brand fits into your life and how you can add value to their brand by posting about them or talking about them or whatever it is.
Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing more cringy than when someone definitely you can tell does not authentically believe in a brand and they're like having to promote it. It's it's very, very like icky. Yeah, it, it's tough. I, I think uh, I've seen a lot of that this year and it. I think I've seen less as NIL has developed throughout the year, yeah. but July 1st was a very scary day last year. <laughs> <laughs> like all of a sudden, all my friends were posting things. And I was like, what is this? And was like, How did this happen? Like, it's midnight and things are happening already. It, it was really scary and it, it just felt noisy. So I, I think that authenticity piece is so important when you're looking for any product, brand, or anything that you're going to be promoting or talking about on your social media. Yeah, hopefully some maturity comes with the year as we as we move into the next phase of whatever <laughs> NIL is. Um, yeah, we're in year that. two, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Growing pains are, are officially, hopefully, out of the way or something. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I really like doing with people like yourself who are kind of looking back on their career now is I love to kind of reflect on what you would change, do differently, what was good, what was bad, because we have a lot of coaches, a lot of people who are, you know, working with athletes now, we have a lot of actually national like governing bodies who listen into the podcast. So I'd love to maybe chop this up into two questions. One is on your college and JO years up to, or sorry, your, your JO and club years up to college, good, bad change. Yes, no. And then maybe segment into at college, good, bad. What would maybe you like to see change if you had a magic wand? So let's start maybe with the, the club years of, of what was good. What was maybe something you would reflect now? And you're like, ah, I could have done that differently a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. There's so much, uh, <laughs> like got to kind of most, revert. Yeah, that's like the most open-ended question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I got to open up the archives, kind of access. <laughs> I haven't accessed them in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I would have taken ownership over the recruitment process and making sure that I understood how important the academic part was with the athletic part and actually like loving the campus. I think I was really blessed to have parents who understood that and made me focus on that. But yeah. now that after being at UF, I like am learning things about Florida that I didn't even know. And I feel like as a recruit, I should have maybe like looked into that. And I, I'm so blessed to end up at an amazing spot and like love love my coaches love the team I, I could not have ended up at a, a place where I fit better but I had no idea what I was getting myself into I, I think I wish I would have maybe taken more visits or yeah just been more invested in that process because I think when you're a club athlete maybe it's shifted now a little bit but I was so focused on elite track and national team camps and that those short-term things when ultimately I knew I wanted to go to college, but that was sort of like a far out thing until all of a sudden it was here. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. College. Well, it's, it's, so, it's so hard, right? Because like you get so starry eyed with the colleges, like, like Florida and Bama and LSU. And like, you get so excited about the gymnastics and about the competition. And like, mm -hmm. I mean, particularly with like, you know, camps, you go to a camp when you're 14, you're like, I'm never not going to Florida. It's like Florida or bust, <laughs> right? Like, but there's yeah. so many other layers to the campus, the academics, the coaching mm -hmm. staff, the people around you. Like, I think it's really important for people to understand how many more layers of research you have to do beyond just like, I love this team and I want to go there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be my advice to to any up and coming club athlete if they're looking into college and want to be recruited or go to go to a school is to do all their research on all the parts of the school, especially the academic part and what the campus feels like, because you will be living there for four years <laughs> or more. And that's where you're getting your education from. So if you know something that you want to study and you go to a school just for gymnastics, but they don't have what you ultimately want to study and yeah. do for the rest of your life, then that may not be the right fit for you. So I guess that's one thing I can think of. Um, there's so many parts and things that I've learned through college that I wish I could go back and no, as a club athlete. Go on, go on. <laughs> <laughs> Spill the tea. <laughs> we we talked about it earlier, but I think just the way that the way that I treat myself and that I speak to myself. Yeah. I used to be so tough on myself as a club athlete. And even though I was competing at such a high level, I think I could have been so much better and would have been even more happy if I would have spoken to myself differently or maybe shifted my priorities when it came to, okay, do I want to break my ankle or do I want to triple full on floor? Like, mm. and I chose the triple full and breaking my ankle. Like I would rather be healthy <laughs> yeah. and not have a triple full on floor, but I, I didn't have the like mental capacity to to make that choice of making sure that I'm set up to be healthy for the long term over mm. a short term goal that I was trying to achieve 
not because truly like I didn't want to be in pain or I didn't want to overtrain myself, but I, I thought that I had to have these hard skills when I learned through college and you can look at my routines that I competed. They're not difficult, but my body felt great. Yeah. <laughs> so realizing just where your values are um, with the physical aspect of the sport. Yeah, this is such an important conversation that I'm happy we're, we're touching on because I have just so much empathy and so much desire to want to share useful information to, I mean, I'm biased, right? Like I went through men's gymnastics. It's hard. It has its own for sure. But like, man, 12 to 15 years old in women's gymnastics is an absolute gauntlet. Like you're, and I have no idea what it's like to be a young female, but I've like coached so many young girls. And it's like, that's, it's just such a brutal time period because of, you know, like you said, body changing skills are harder. You have goals, social media, parent pressure. Sometimes the club environment is pretty tough. And I think that we really, so much of what happens in college, whether it's injuries or burnout, I think unfortunately can be traced back to what we're doing between 10 to 15 at club level. Like I really believe that. And so I am on a, like a, an ever ending mission to try to find as much useful advice to parents and coaches and athletes of that age group to like go back and be like, yo, slow down. Like just, just calm down here. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why I'm feeling like in a very sharing mood, but like that mm -hmm. that's so true. Um, I could go back even further and just talk about like my my coaching relationship from yes. I think 10 to 14 was not a healthy one. Yeah. I was in a group that trained in the morning away from like spectating eyes. Um, so a lot of like words were said and emotional abuse happened that shouldn't have happened. And that that really messed with my head going into those years of 13 to 15 or 13 to even 17 graduating. And I thankfully got out of that situation, but I didn't get out of it because I realized that it was wrong. Like I, I thought it was fine and it was just great coaching. And I, I always felt like I wasn't good enough as such a, a young athlete. Like I'm a kid. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I thought I wasn't good enough. I, I thought I would never make it to college gymnastics or never make it to elite gymnastics, or I wasn't even capable of doing skills in it it got so draining just the the way that I was being coached and spoken to as if I was worthless that all of those thoughts that I was creating in my head from the words I was receiving became true. Like it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that I couldn't do my gymnastics and I, I wasn't good enough to make the meets that I wanted to make too because I was like brainwashed in a way to believe that. Then I had a major coaching switch at 14 mm -hmm. and then got in a really healthy coaching relationship and was able to start turning all of that around. But I think for parents and for athletes, it's, it's so important to be able to check in with your kid or check in with yourself to make sure that the way that you are speaking to yourself and the way that you're being spoken to are uplifting. Um, and it's such a fine line because in gymnastics, you have to be tough and yeah. you need to work and you got to be ready to work. And sometimes your coach has to say something that you don't want to hear. And yeah. that's fine. That's not bad. But if they're saying things that take away from your identity as a human being, that's crossing a line. Um, and I, I experienced that and it took me so long to rebuild that. So I, I think from a, a club perspective, it's, it's really important to check in on those things and make sure you're good. Um, and I, I had to build all the way back from zero, like probably beneath zero. I was in the negatives. I was below the floor when I had no gymnastics. I like felt worthless and then ended up building it back and making it to the national team, going to Florida and overcoming all of those things. But I think I still can get in a mindset where I, I think I'm not good enough or, that I don't deserve to be on a team or be in a lineup spot because of that experience that I had where I was spoken to and I was speaking to myself so negatively and in a way that I truly believed back then. So mm. I don't know if there's like any piece no, of advice in a me. one sentence, but I'm, I'm so happy. happy that you mentioned it because you being in a sharing mood probably just helped <laughs> thousands of people because let's, let's just be really, I'm trying to be very transparent and honest in the podcast. We've made a lot of progress since the whole scandal came out and since the cultural change and people have been moving around, there has been a lot of really good progress made. And I want to applaud the efforts from not only the U S but also multiple other countries that I've mm -hmm. talked with, whether it's like the UK coming out with their report. So there has been good progress, but let's just be yeah. really honest for people is that like there are still so many pockets of gymnastics that have this really dark 
toxic culture of whether it's a coaching environment or whether it's a parent pressure, whether it's gymnasts and teammates that there are a lot of kids who are still experiencing just straight up emotional abuse. And it's like, you know, yeah. here is these side comments. And honestly, it's sometimes it's, it's the silence is deafening. It's neglect. A lot of like just neglect is still emotional abuse where if you're hurt or if you don't make a series or this, you're just like off in the corner by yourself and you don't get, you know, talked to, that's just as dangerous as somebody coming out mm -hmm. and saying like, you know, you're this or you're that, or you look a certain way that you're growing and going through puberty. So like, it's still very real that a lot of people are going through that. And I think people who are maybe, I don't know if they're blissfully unaware or they just know it's a problem. They don't want to deal with it. They look the other way. The, the whiplash that that has on a young 12 to 14 year old athlete's psyche is hugely damaging. And right. I think that you saying that it exists allows somebody else permission to be like, that's me. I'm going through that. And I don't want to be a part of this anymore. So thank mm -hmm. you for sharing it. Yeah, of course. It, it's sometimes hard to talk about because sure. there. Of course, like for my personal experience, it, it was something that was very difficult. And I'm like happy that I was able to get out of it and thankful for my parents recognizing and getting me out of it. Um, but it's also so tough to talk about because I don't want to take away from the toughness that's necessary for the sport. Sure. But there's a line. There's a difference. Um, for sure. And I, I want athletes to grow up and to be mentally tough and to be able to have hard conversations because that's what sports is so great for. But I don't want them to grow up feeling like part of them is missing because something's been taken away from them. Yeah. And that's the fine line that coaches need to, to differentiate on because it's so important. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great to hear you say that, you know, it, you can be, you can be uh, tough and you can have expectations and you can have goals that you pursue without being mean, right? There's a very big difference between yeah. some of the best coaches I know in the world are, uh, I'm not firm is the word I want to say, but they just like, they have, they have a plan. They want to do things. Training is hard, but they're still very kind to the athletes. And when you watch them, there's never this weird feeling of like, Oh my God, like this person's cruel. And I've seen some of the highest level, literally gold medalists, like be okay. So like it can happen for both. But the, I think a really important piece of, 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 uh, you know, content to extract here is like, in order for you to get out of that situation, you had parents who stepped in and were able to make that change. Right. And I think that's for me, what still needs to be happening is like coaches, whether it's like coach to coach peer pressure of like someone stepping in like, yo, easy. Like that's not at all what you, you say to a kid, but also like parents, NGBs, gym owners, like you have to have a spine, man. You have to stand up and be like, no, this is not what we tolerate as a culture. This is not how you treat kids and like step in and actually do something about it. Right. Because yeah. I, I have a lot of situations where on the medical side, someone's like, okay, this injury keeps happening or this person's missing this. And I'm like, okay, well, you have to, you have to like step in and talk to the coach or leave the gym and then go, well, like there's no other gyms that are high level in the area. Like, what am I going to do for this athlete who wants a scholarship? I'm like, you gotta, you gotta make a hard choice. I'm sorry, but this is nothing is worth what you're going through mentally and physically right now. It's not worth it. Right. Well, you also have to, I think something that also needs to change and is changing is the way that you what's the word the way that you value a coach's expertise yes. because not just technical it, yes the way that you're weighing how a coach is coaching you it's they shouldn't just know how to coach great gymnastics because mm. that's tough and not a lot of people can do that but also not a lot of coaches have both where they can coach a person and coach an athlete um mm. in the specific sport or area that they're coaching them in and that pairing is so important and that's what makes great coaches and they're hard to come by but someone who can grow in both of those areas is the kind of coach that I would want my kid or my previous self to be coached by. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's hard to dance around this sometimes, but like you can, you can teach somebody the technical things. If someone is open to learning, you can take someone who knows a, a good amount and find a good mentor or find online resources and clinics to teach them the skills they need to do. You can't teach someone how to be nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? If someone is, if someone is miserable and they don't like their own personal life and they're bleeding that into the gym, they feel that their own self-esteem is yelling at kids to feel good. Like you can't, it's really hard to undo that and uproot that. So like, Find someone who is yeah. maybe moderately technical and understands the mm -hmm. basics, and then we can find a way to get you the information you need. Like if, if you're if you're listening to this podcast and you need that advice, we'll, well I'll give you everything for free that we possibly have. <laughs> That's your situation. But yeah, yeah. you got to rip someone out of that toxic environment, man. For sure, and nothing is more important than having a mentally fit athlete as well, yeah. because you're not going to succeed under any pressure, circumstance, any competition, any difficult situation that you're going to face in a sport if you can't be mentally tough and yeah. a technical a solely technical coach cannot teach you how to be mentally tough because yeah. that that requires someone to 
build you up and invest in you as a person and as an athlete. And that goes deeper than saying point your toes or stretch or throw the bar. Like (laughs) that doesn't touch that deep. Um, I did have, no, go go ahead. You, you, you. (laughs) Oh, I I did have one other thought. I know that that's kind of like a deep, dense conversation. Um, Maybe a little (laughs) somber, Um, even though there is progress being made, but to speak on parents, um, something that came to mind, something that my parents did for me that I think was the best thing they could have ever done for me is let gymnastics be my own. Um, I was the one who at three, four years old said that I wanted to do gymnastics and they finally gave in and let me do gymnastics. (laughs) But from that point, it was my sport. They weren't, they were of course driving me to practice and making sure I had food and water and like leotard, everything I needed to succeed. But it was my thing. And that gave me ownership over the sport and over my career in a way that I noticed was different from some of my younger teammates who I grew up with, whose parents constantly fought battles for them, um, or were watching every single practice and every skill that they did and knew the lingo and knew how to talk gymnastics with them. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I just felt very empowered by my parents to grow up and feel confident and strong in my own abilities as a gymnast because I always knew that I did it. If I got a medal, I earned it. Yes, my parents drove me to the meet and made sure I got there and were like the most supportive, but I did it for myself. And that built a lot of confidence in me knowing that I was capable of having hard conversations with my coach, with my teammates, uh, working hard and putting the work in. And if my parents picked me up from practice and were like, how was practice? And all I said was good. They're like, oh my gosh, we paid so much money for this and all we get is good. But they're like, okay, cool, good. As long as you're good, we're good. Keep working hard. And that was it. And that is the best thing that they could have ever done for me. And I'm so grateful for that. Honestly, you took the words out of my mouth because I was going to bring up the same thing is that every time I've been really fortunate on the podcast, talk to Olympians, like NCAA champions, and everyone has the same exact thing. Parents are parents, right? Their parents are there for them, no matter what ups, downs, in betweens, and they're not over coaching. They're not helicoptering. They're nothing. They're like, this is your thing, and I'm here to support you. And I think the theme to pull out here for coaches and for parents is unconditional support, right? Like un- from a parent, unconditional love, and from a coach, it's unconditional support. Like with me coaching, it's like I, I couldn't tell you how little I care whether the person is going to like do amazing or not do well. Whether it's the matter of like I still care about them and I want to support them, like it really has to be detached from the performance. It's like you can be a, a joint pursuit towards a goal, especially at the high level, but like you should really have one thousand percent unconditional support for the athlete, no matter what happens inside and outside the gym. And I think that's really important. Yeah, for sure. It's it's those boundaries too. Um, giving me something to take ownership of and to build and to grow in was so important for my development as like an athlete, as a woman, as a future professional or whatever I'm going to do, because I I feel like I can be a leader in my own life. I can lead myself because I was empowered to do so. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And then these last little few minutes here, I guess, just chop it up to the end of anything. And from college, like all the athletes that are going to listen to us who are actively in college, are there things that you were like looking back, you're like, ah, I could have maybe done that better. That would have helped a little bit. I mean, we've covered a lot, but Yeah, a a big thing for me that I've even just realized this past year is if you're at a school, you're there for a reason, you're on the team for a reason, and you you have a purpose being on that team. I came into Florida when we had Kennedy Baker, Alex McMurtry, Alicia Boren, like some, I also, I came in with Jazzy Fobrick and Alyssa Bauman, like some crazy talented athletes. And I was like, oh. (laughs) Imposter syndrome sets in. I'm just me. (laughs) (laughs) And I let that define me. And I I kind of started believing those thoughts um, for a while. And it affected my my happiness in my spot on the team. And I always felt like I kind of I wasn't worthy of the lineup spot or it's okay if I fell because I'm not them or whatever it was. And I finally realized that I, I am here because I am me, not because I'm them. And that was so powerful for me because I I stopped trying to be like the Alyssa Bauman or the Trinity Thomas, who are as amazing in their way as they can possibly be. But I realized that I could be as amazing as I could possibly be as me. And that was the biggest thing that contributed to me being able to perform and contribute in a way like I had never before because I stopped trying to be like all the other amazing athletes on my team and started trying to play to my own strengths and just be myself. So uh, Mm -hmm. for any incoming athlete or 
current athlete out there or a parent of an athlete who needs to like encourage them like that is huge to just know that all you have to do is be yourself because you're there for a reason if you were recruited there for like you are there because Mm. you are you not because you are like someone else sure yeah absolutely man this is a great way to end, right? So, Megan, thank you so much. That was a jam packed. We like we like ran all over the place, but that was great. <laughs> we did. We ran in circles all the way up and down. It it was a pleasure. I I've been so happy to chat with you, and it's an honor to be here. Absolutely. So we'll put this up, and then we'll make sure. Uh, where can people find you for all future things, Megan Skaggs? For sure, uh, you can find me on Instagram at Megan underscore Skaggs, or on Twitter at Megan Skaggs underscore, or on my website MeganSkaggs.com. Perfect. Thanks, Meg. Thank you.